A family can never really be known by an outsider. All families have their secrets, good and bad, that they keep from those outside. All families have their own language, half sentences, key words, certain expressions that have meaning to them alone. All families are repositories of feelings, negative ones such as resentment, jealousy, guilt, hurt and anger, as well as positive feelings of tenderness, love and shared happiness. Many of these feelings are never spoken about or shared with others. An outsider hoping to assess the family then faces a most difficult task. And this task is even more challenging if he or she has some official function that the family could interpret as being threatening. Nevertheless, the well-prepared professional can elicit and utilize valuable information about a family's internal processes through a skilled family assessment. Some professionals, such as family therapists, contract with the family and use the information from assessment to intervene and help the family resolve its problems, usually those of a psychiatric mental health nature. Other professionals, such as social workers, nurses, or school counselors, may use the information to help them to better understand the family situation, and thus to work more effectively with the family. In general, this program will focus on the latter. An overview of the family assessment process helps the professional conduct an organized, logical evaluation. The amount and type of information gathered will vary, depending on the purpose of the interview, the needs of the family or family members seeking help, and the qualifications of the assessor. Judgment is needed in deciding to limit or expand questioning in a particular area. It is helpful to begin the formal assessment by obtaining broad identifying data about the family, particularly its socio-cultural background. This includes finding out who lives in the home and their relationships to each other. The family's cultural orientation, social class, and economic status should also be noted, along with the family's recreational activities. The professional then obtains a detailed family history and estimates the stage of development of the family. Assessing for signs of situational crisis or crises which could be precipitated by the family's passing from one developmental stage to another. Next, the family structure should be determined. This includes noting both the formal and informal roles that the family members assume and determining the power structure in the family. In addition, an assessment is made of the family's communication processes and its value system. As part of assessing structure, the professional also determines the boundaries, or their absence, in the family's subsystems and whether the family is open, closed, or random. Finally, family functions are assessed. The professional examines the family's ability to fulfill the economic, affective, socialization, and health care needs of the individual family members. The basic steps for a family assessment then include gathering broad identifying data, obtaining a family history, estimating the developmental stage of the family, and determining the structure and function of the family. The professional has various techniques for gathering the information needed for making a family assessment. One is observation of family behaviors and interactions. Dr. Michael Goldstein, Department of Psychology, UCLA, discusses the importance of such observation for the professional. One of the beauties of seeing a family together is that you observe how they behave with each other in, in actual life. You're not dealing with reports of what goes on at home or things of this sort. First information comes from the physical arrangement that the family spontaneously chooses in the room. Who sits where? Uh, who sits close to whom? Who distances themselves from each other? Gives you some clue of the psychological organization of the family. So that you reason by analogy that people who choose to sit together feel some connection and that the degree of physical closeness that they place their chair with each other is a measure of the degree 
of that affiliation with each other. The second kind of behavior that's very important is who talks to whom and who's acknowledged when they speak as to clues as to the hierarchy of importance and significance in the family. That some people talk frequently in a family but no one picks up on what they say. It's not even that they're disagreed with, it's that there's no response to them. So you get a sense that they are a non-person in the eyes of the family or a low status person. Other people don't say much, but when they do, it's extremely important. And everybody picks up on it, and it, it leads to a, a series of discussions of, of interactions in the family. So these become a very important clue as to who are the high and low impact people in the family. You also look for whether there, there's any uh, striving for organization in the family. Uh, in some families, parents behave like parents. When kids become unruly, they do something or try to modify the behavior of the kid. In other families, you notice that all kinds of behavior goes uncontrolled. Uh, it, it lacks any effort at control. And you would think of this family, it's chaotic in some way because it lacks anybody being in charge. It hasn't become organized the way a group can when it functions well. And that is a very important clue because then it suggests you must work on getting a stable organization of that family before you attempt to do anything about other kinds of issues. We see then that observation of family behaviors includes the physical arrangement of its members as an indicator of closeness of relationships, the interactions of its members as a manifestation of family hierarchy, and parental control as a clue to the degree of organization. Health-related questioning is another information-gathering technique. When illness or injury is present, professionals, especially those in the health professions, should ask families about such matters. Questions, of course, should be asked to assess the family's knowledge about the particular health problem and how the family is presently coping with the problem. Questions should be asked to determine the impact of the illness on other family members. Often the person in greatest need is not the patient himself, but the primary caregiver who is already overburdened and overwhelmed, or a young child who does not completely understand the situation or believes he or she has done something to cause the problem. There are also questions concerning the family's cultural beliefs, patterns, and practices that should be asked. Dr. Marilyn Friedman, professor, Department of Nursing, California State University, Los Angeles, addresses the special awareness professionals need when asking such questions. One of the big dangers about talking about cultural patterns in families is that we often stereotype. We assume that we know about the family when we really don't know. Uh, there's various degrees of acculturation and some people do not want to be traditional and for them um, it's almost insulting to assume that they're traditional and would want to say go to a folk practitioner. Some of the general areas of questions that can be asked families might be their uh, health habits, uh, their health beliefs, some of the practices that they use for both prevention and, and cure, um, who they uh, turn to when they have questions about health, that's very much culturally derived. Uh, who in the family assumes the role of being the health provider is often very culturally uh, determined. And uh, so culture becomes a variable that is pervasive throughout all the work we do and then in, in the various dimensions that we assess. Health-related questioning of the family, then, should include their knowledge level, their support system, the impact of the illness on the different family members, and their cultural beliefs and practices. A final technique to gather information is employing activities to facilitate understanding of family structure and family dynamics. Dr. Darlene McCallum, Associate Dean, School of Nursing, University of Rochester, New York, discusses activities she has nursing students use with families during home visits. One of the things that we ask our students to do is to set aside a time with the family to go over the fa a family album. 
and have the family bring pictures of their family and tell the professional about those. And that has been very revealing. It is a very warm time between the professional and the family. And a lot of information about the family can be gleaned. And are they all pictures of the children when they're babies? Are there any pictures of the children as teenagers? Is one child selected over the other? You know, off there's lots of pictures of the first child, but not of the second and third children. Some of those issues that come up and can be openly talked about, well, why don't you have pictures of the second child? Well, we didn't have time. Some of it is legitimate. Some of it is, well, this is an adopted child. So you look for the various clues as the information about the family is gathered. Dr. McCown discusses how genograms, elaborate family trees, can be used by the professional to become familiar with the family and the major issues affecting it. A genogram builds rapport immediately. This person can come in sit down with the family as a group and breaking the ice with the family by doing a genogram. A genogram basically is a schematic representation of the family structure. It is used to identify who the family members are, what their ages are, what the main issues have been that the family's been dealing with, what the crises are and what the health status is of the whole family, not just an individual client, but of the whole family. What the practitioner would do is to first identify the three generations. You start with the client and the go get information about one generation above and one generation below. If it's a young child, then you go the parents and the grandparents. In general, the symbols for the genogram are circles for females, squares for males, the lines have meanings. Horizontal lines connect usually by marriage, and vertical lines connect children to parents. Two hash lines down across that horizontal line would indicate divorce or separation, and a D or an S would indicate divorce or separation. And a key is usually needed on the genogram to indicate what the symbols mean that you've put on there. The information that's needed in the genogram is not only three generations, but the age, sex, dates of death, the birth order. If there are three or four children, then you identify this is female, one, two, three. Illnesses, heart attacks, diabetes, cancer, any major surgeries are included on the genogram and the date of the surgery. In addition, one would include significant life events, transitions, crises. Some of those would be graduation, moving, uh, important car accident, maybe a problem with drugs, someone in jail. Those kinds of crises are important because those do have impact for the family. The information from the genogram either may be used only by the professional for data gathering or it may be used to give feedback to the family. It can be used as a tool to point out, look at how many breast cancers there have been in your family. Have you had a mammogram? Or it could be used to say, look how many people have been alcoholics. Is there a problem with this if that problem hasn't been identified? Family sculpture is another assessment activity for eliciting information about family relationships. While methods of family sculpturing may vary depending on the professional, the concept remains the same. In one version of family sculpture, the family is asked to physically place themselves in positions that reflect their relationships. That is, the way they perceive themselves to be emotionally with other members of the family. In another version, the family labels pieces of paper with the names of family members or pets or of things that are important in the family, such as a job or even a TV set, and position them on a paper to show relationships and then they begin drawing lines around them by connecting them up to show how connected they are. Then the professional can sit down and ask the family then, explain this to me, you know, what, what do you see here? And they talk about who the people are. They have some realization also about who was left out, who wasn't put in this and why. And so in the course of that, the family does an activity together. The professional has a chance to see how they interact in the process, to ask them questions about it, to see who they left out, who they put close together, what objects were there, and gives a lot of insight for assessment into what are the dynamics of this family.
Activities to facilitate the professional's understanding, then, include reviewing a family album to determine relationships, making a genogram to establish rapport, diagram family structure, and record health and other significant events, and creating a family sculpture to reveal the emotional makeup and relationships in the family. After all the information is gathered from observations, health-related questions, and activities to facilitate understanding, such as genograms and family sculpture, the skilled professional has the body of information needed to make a knowledgeable, reasoned, comprehensive, and valid family assessment.